So uh, we are continuing our series on grace. This is our summer series. In fact, it could take us all the way to the end of summer, which is September 20th. So we could breed, bleed into September as we finish our topic on grace. We Both Pastor Josh and myself have a lot more to share with you about this. It is, the, in my opinion, the most important subject in the Bible for you to live by, win by, exist, and relate with God. Today, I want to talk to you about taking back what belongs to you. And this is what I mean. There are a lot of things that have been stolen from you, taken from you, dreams that you've wanted that haven't been accomplished, things that belong to you that are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the cross, by your faith, and that you haven't seen them happen. You haven't accomplished those things. You have been with some things that you lack in and some other things that just haven't happened. I want you to realize that you're in a battleground for the grace of God. And what I mean by that is God's grace has been given to you to be to bring your life into his will. And when we don't walk in the grace of God, we don't see all that he has for us. We don't see everything that's already been paid for. We are not benefiting from all of the blessings. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. So you should be living in that life today, wherever you're at. For an example, if you're in Afghanistan right now, the abundant life would be your faith won't fail, that you will not give up on who you are in Christ at the face of death. That would be the grace of God giving you strength to face the greatest challenge of all, your own life. God asking you, we in the Western world have not seen that level of persecution, but it's According to the Bible, the world gets, comes to an end. When we get closer to the end times, persecution of Christianity is going to rise. So you need to be full of faith today so when things get tough, you're still full of faith. So as I talk to you about grace today and about what we're doing in Romans chapter 5, I want you to understand that the whole goal of where we're headed is when you know who you are in Christ and what your rights are, what your privileges are, then you have you can hold on to them. You can keep them. So I'm going to talk to you at home, talk to you here in the house. Once you get your Bibles out at home with your Bibles open here, yes, the scriptures will be on the screen, but I really like it when you bring a Bible, whether that's electronic or, or paper, but that you could follow along. And we're in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 8. And it says here in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That verse, this verse right here, Romans 5, 8 is explosive if you will take time to digest it. If you'll take a moment to let it get inside you and let it become part of you and just think about it for a moment. It says here that God demonstrates this word, this Greek word for demonstrates means to make known by action. You need to not feel the love of God. You need to know the love of God by his actions. You need to accept the love of God by, his, by faith, by the actions that God does. Here's what he's saying in verse 8 again. But God demonstrates by his action his own love toward us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know what's amazing? What this verse is telling us, God didn't wait for us to get better, to send Jesus. He didn't wait for humanity to improve when he sent Jesus. He didn't wait for everybody to repent, then he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus when we were at our worst, when we were sinners, enemies of him. He sent his son to die for you. He demonstrated his love for you. He showed you by action how much he loves you. Don't you think it's insulting when you tell somebody, I love you, and they say, I don't think so. It just kind of rubs you wrong, doesn't it? And here's God saying, I love you, and you're saying, prove it. Well, look at the cross. No, make my life better. Look at the cross. No, I want this. Look at the cross. And God's trying to communicate to you. He's trying to get across to you that he has demonstrated his love for you. Look at verse 9. Much more, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The two words, much more, the Greek words, the word much means much, great, extensive, and the word more means even more. And here's how it's read. You could read verse 9. Even much more or greater than much. If you think there's a lot, then add more to it. And then it says, now that you have been justified by his blood, 
Will we shall be saved from wrath through him. Here's what he's saying is, God wants to save you from life. He wants to help you in every situation that you're facing to be victorious. He wants you to be able to go all the way through and never give up your faith, never let down, and never lack confidence in him. And he says, now that you belong to him, he's going to much more help you. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, here's the same two words, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So he's saying, he reiterates it. He he repeats himself in verse 19, basically. And he said, when you were a sinner, God sent his son Jesus to die for you. You weren't, now that you have good in you, because God put it in you, won't he much more help you? If he was willing to help you when you had no good at all, but now you've been justified by the blood, which means he's put good in you, will he not help you even more? And the words for much more is trying to say, won't he even do it more? Think about this. He had his son die for you personally. His son died for you personally. And when his son died for you personally, he said, now that you belong to me, Now that you're my son or daughter, won't I help you even more than that? Where should our confidence be? Our confidence should be in the Lord. Our confidence should be in what Christ has done for us. Verse 11, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And he's saying, he's trying to get this across. This is actually Paul writing and repeating himself for the third time in the same sentence, basically, or the same paragraph. He says, not only that, but we should also rejoice because we have received the reconciliation. The word reconciliation means to reestablish proper, friendly, inter- interpersonal relations after these have been disrupt- disrupted or broken. Here's what he's saying. It goes back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in perfect relationship with God. God showed up at the end of the day, walked with Adam, talked with him, had conversation with him. He knew God personally. But then Adam broke relationship with God. When Adam and Eve committed sin, what they ended up doing, they committed treason against God, broke relationship. They died in their relationship. God told them, if the day you eat of that tree, on that day you will die. And it says that you will, in the Hebrew, that you will die, which is in the plural, that you'll have deaths. Well, the first death was separation from God. When Adam and Eve committed that sin, they were separated. They died to God. They're no longer alive to God. They're no longer in his his family. They're no longer in a living relationship. It's been broken. Then later in life, they died again of a physical death. And now everyone is born dead to God and eventually die physically. But before you die physically, God gives you the opportunity by his grace to accept what Jesus has done on the cross so you you can be born again. That born again experience is reconciliation, where the broken relationship is restored. And God says there's no broken relationship. Get this, the good news of the gospel is God's not mad at you. He has reconciled you to himself. He has reestablished your friendly interpersonal relationship. He has reestablished it. Now, in verses 12 through 14, it come, here's what happens. Paul explains in verses 12 through 14, he explains this. Adam, the first man, brought sin into the world and it affected everybody. The last Adam, Jesus, took care of it. The first man caused the problem. Jesus took care of it. We pick it up in verse 15 and it says this, but the free gift is not like the offense, the offense being what Adam did, causing everyone to die. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. It is a gift. And what you need to know is God has given you the gift of life. He has given you the gift of reconciliation. He's given you the gift of justification, which we've explained a few weeks ago. He's given you the gift of being in the family. He's given you the gift of new life. It says in verse 15 again, but 
The free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, many died, that's Adam, a bunch of people died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace by the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. In other words, we live because of Jesus. We died because of Adam. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for judgment came from one offense resulted, resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Hold on, let me help you with this, because this is so fun if you're in seminary. If you're having a college class on the book of Romans or you know, going to write a paper on Romans, here's something that you gotta, Paul is repeating the same thing again. He's trying to get this, this is the simple thing he's trying to say. Adam caused sin that caused everyone to die. But the last Adam, Jesus, causes everyone to live. Through him is justification. Through him is reconciliation. Through him is coming back into the family. He says it again and again. Why? Why is he saying it so many times? Because you need to know that you're okay with God and God's okay with you. Because if you don't, you're already defeated. You will never get back what's been taken from you if you don't realize God's not your enemy. If you don't understand and grasp that while you were a sinner, he had his son die for you. Now that you're one of his, he's going to fight to the death himself. And guess who's not going to die? God. But he's trying to communicate, I will fight for you. I will fight for you. And he's trying to get that across to every one of us. And he says in verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reign through the one, much more, there's those same two words, much more, extensive, even more, great amount. Those who receive, listen to this, abundance of grace, abundance of grace, abundance of grace. Abundance means a bunch. Abundance of grace, trying to get communi communicate to you, there's not one grace experience. It's grace wave after wave of grace. And he says, from the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Jesus Christ. If you understand the gift of righteousness, which is simply put this way, God's not mad at you, you're okay with God, you're justified, you're in the family of God, you are one, we are tight, whatever term you want to use, we are good. If you understand that, and you live in abundance of grace, you will reign. You will reign in life. But you know what causes you not to reign in life? Now, we're about to go into what I will call the battlefield of life. The battlefield of life is not who you're married to. It's not who you work for. It's not who works with you. It's not your school. It's not your professor, your teacher, the public education. The battlefield of life is your mind. Everything is won or lost inside your thinking cap. All that you, it's what you think is what you are going to manifest in life. And as you think all these horrible thoughts about yourself, you will lose and you won't get what God wants you to have in life. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The entire battlefield is your thought process. And while you're flipping to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm just going to read verse 17 of Romans 5 again. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one causing everybody to die. Adam committed sin. Everyone died. It controlled. No one had any choice. That sin reigned. It controlled everything. Then he says here, much more. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign, control. The other forces have no choice in life through the one Jesus Christ. You need to take control of your thought life. You need to take control of what's going on in your brain because the enemy, the devil, demonic spirits are after your mind. Every one of you that's in this room, everyone watching online, everyone that's going to watch in the future has been attacked in their mind by demonic spirits. I'm sorry, but I don't believe in demon spirits. Well, that doesn't matter. They still exist. 
If Jesus cast them out, that means they existed. If Jesus dealt with them, that means they're there. If the Bible says they exist, they are. Just because you've never seen one doesn't mean, I've never seen Thomas Jefferson, but I believe he existed. I don't know how that, that just came out. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, here's what it says. Verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, which simply means, the, the Greek word for walk means order one's behavior. In fact, it has this picture, this image, that you put one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, and that you put your one foot in front of the other on purpose, thinking about what you're doing, and you are going. This is life. You are walking in life. Though we walk, we live in the flesh. We have flesh. We have this body. We are we have limitations because of our flesh, but all of us have flesh. Though we live in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Paul now brings, in the book of 2 Corinthians, he brings this military image into us to help us understand how to win in life, how to get back what belongs to us, how, how we are supposed to win. He says, though we walk in, the, walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, which means that our weapons, the things that belong to us to win in life, can't be our own flesh, which means it can't be our education, can't be our finances, can't be our personality, it can't be our DNA. We win because of something that's not flesh. And if you think that you're battling this life through stuff that's flesh, through your capabilities, through your great, your great skills, through your talent, through your, through your heritage, through your finances, you are on the wrong playing field because that's not where the battle is. Because when you put your head down at night and your brain is saying all kinds of things that are against what the, word, the will and the word of God say, how are you going to win because you got a big bank account? How are you going to win because you just got a new car? How are you going to win because uh, you lost some weight? How you, that doesn't help you in this warfare. You following me on this? Amen. So what we have, what we understand is verse 4. For the weapons, plural, underline the word weapons, more than one. For the weapons of our warfare, the fight that we are in, are not carnal. Same word for flesh. But mighty in God. Oh, that phrase, mighty in God. That is just an awesome phrase because what it exalts is God himself, not us. They're mighty in God. Powerful. Powerful in God for pulling down strongholds, pulling down strongholds. This, this Greek word for strongholds, it means it's a military fortress, a strong military fortress. Paul says you're in a war and you are coming against strongholds. You are coming against things that have been built up. A stronghold is something that has been built up. It took time to build it, but it has a foundation. It has strength. It has walls. It's, think of a, a giant, big war Think of a castle. That's a good one. Giant castle. And what it says here, it goes, for our weapons are for the purpose of pulling down strongholds. If you use the weapons of God that come through the grace of God for other things than pulling down strongholds, it's not going to work. I'll say, I, I hope to get back to that because that's something that just flashed in my mind by the Holy Spirit that I want to, ex, to examine and, and share a little bit deeper on. But I want, to, I want you to look at the word strongholds. You're going to pull down these strongholds. Look at verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, this is a big chunk. Let's just take our time and look at it. Look at the words casting down. Casting down. It's one Greek word. The word casting down means to destroy completely by tearing down and dismantling. To destroy, to tear down, it means absolute destruction. And according to verse 5, it says that we are completely destroying, tearing down, casting down two things arguments and high things. Arguments and every high thing. 
Arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. The Greek word for arguments is extremely important for you to understand. It means misleading and deceptive reasoning by implication. It means that you have a thought about who you are and the Bible has a statement about who you are and they're not the same. Your thoughts about who you are in Christ don't agree with what the Bible says. In other words, you don't agree with what God has declared about you and you are facing an argument. And it's usually a misleading, deceptive reasoning by implication where the thought is implying you're less than. The thought is implying you can't have it. The thought gives an implication. It's not going to work for you. You're different than everyone else. You can't get healed. You can't get that new job. You can't get that prayer answered. You can't have what you really desire. You can't have it because God is holding it from you. These are all arguments that are coming against the will of God. When God's will clearly declares something and you are having thoughts in your head that are declaring the the opposite, you are in the middle of an argument, you are in the middle of a warfare. For some reason, most charismatic Christians think spiritual warfare is talking really loud during prayer. They think screaming is spiritual warfare. Like when I'm praying, I'm gonna scream. Now I just did warfare. No, it's in your head. It's for you to cast down, completely destroy, utterly destroy, completely tear down misleading, deceptive reasonings that are based on evil intentions. These arguments are coming against you and they are declaring you're not good enough. You didn't do this well enough. You didn't pray enough. You're not beautiful. You're ugly. You're mean. Every thought that comes to tear you down, every thought that comes to be to neg- neglect, neglect, negate the word of God, every thought that comes to try to get you to deny or doubt God is a stronghold thought. It's an argument to come against you, and the more you let it in your brain, the stronger the stronghold gets. Now, the next word is high thing. These two words, high thing, it is an exaggerated evaluation of what one is or what one has done. It's conceit, pride, arrogance. An exaggerated evaluation of what one is or what one has done. This is an individual who says everything is the best that they've ever, you know, I'm the best, I'm the best. Everything we do is the best. This is where, now let's put it in context. Look at verse five again. Casting down arguments literally destroying arguments and every high thing, everything that exalts itself, that puffs itself up, that says it's bigger than God. You know what those thoughts are in your head? When you feel like you have a dream that you're gonna do something, you're gonna start a company, you're gonna make a product, you're gonna go do something, and, or you're gonna be something, and then these thoughts come in into your mind to declare that you're not sufficient enough, you're not good enough, you don't have enough education, how could you ever think about doing that? Those high things are coming to tear you down. They have to be destroyed. They have to be cast down. They have to be literally taken apart. And here's verse five again. Casting down arguments and every high thing. These are thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and say, God can't do anything about this for you. Or they tell you because of the color of your skin, you can't do this. Because of your age, because of your sex, because of whatever it is might be that's going on in your life, they're disqualifying. These are thoughts that constantly disqualify you. You are in the middle of warfare. You're in the middle of a battle. You're in the middle of a fight. Paul calls this warfare. And the only way you're going to win is if you use the spiritual weapons that are mighty in God. The only way you're going to win. And then it says this in verse five, casting out arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity. 
This is an interesting Greek word, captivity, because it's used as the military term. And it, it literally means to take by point or spear point. It, it has the image of you have a spear and you have the enemy and the, and the spear is in the back of the enemy and you're causing the enemy to walk forward to its captivity, its place of prison, its confinement. Today, we don't use spears. Today, you would modernize that by saying you have an AR-15 or an M-16. <laughs> that you have a rifle, semi-automatic rifle. If you're military, you have a fully automatic rifle, and it is in the back of the enemy, pointed right at the enemy, and the enemy is being pushed out. God says that he wants you to put your weapon in the back of every thought that comes against God's word and kick it out. Do not entertain it. Don't have it for a moment. Recently, um, this was at the end of the school year, uh, this last school year, our grandson was playing in one of his last uh, lacrosse games. And Suzette and I had not had the privilege of actually seeing ever play lacrosse him in, in in a tournament. So we at the last minute said, he's in Phoenix. He said, let's go. We're going to go to Phoenix. We're going to get in the car. We're driving to Phoenix. We're going to be at that tournament. We're going to have dinner with them. The next morning, we're going to get up and drive home. Well, we did that. We, we drove to Phoenix. We checked into the hotel. And uh, we, we checked into the hotel. We got our room. We settled down the room. We've been in the room for probably an hour. I go into the bathroom. And on the floor in the bathroom is a snake. And the snake is this. I mean, it startled me. I was like, what? (laughs) Now, would you leave the snake in the room? Would you go to bed with the snake in the bathroom? Then why do you leave thoughts in your brain? I acted instantly. I just reacted. I grabbed the trash can, flipped it upside down, put it on the snake, and then I put something else on that to hold it down, and I called management. They were shocked. They came, you know, um, they didn't know. They, they said this never happened before. You know, and, and, uh, they ended up giving us the room for free. You, you, yeah. But the thing is, there's a snake in the room. Now, and we saw it. We caught it. There it is. I don't care that there's a waste basket on top of it. You're not going to bed with the snake. You're going to deal with the issue right now. Am I right? You need to deal with every thought that comes into your mind because it's a snake of the enemy. Anything that comes into your brain that tells you and it comes against you or it comes against your relationships. How about when you have this this thought process that comes out and and you, you start doubting your spouse? Well, I don't think they told me the truth. And they've never lied to you before. Because the enemy wants to split you up. The enemy wants to hurt you. The enemy wants to hurt your relationship. That you have to expose those snakes in your brain and get them out. Chase them out. You need to get out your spiritual AR-15 and put it in the back of the thought and get it out of your brain. Don't leave it in your brain. Don't entertain it. Don't have it there. You need to take it into captivity. And then it says, let's look at it again in verse 5. Casting down, literally destroying every argument. How do I do that? How do I destroy every argument when I have this thought that's going against the word of God? I've got the Bible telling me that I'm precious in the eyes of God. I got the Bible telling me that I am the apple of his eye. I got the Bible telling me that I'm bought by it with a price. I've got the Bible telling me that God loves me, but yet in my head, I think that he doesn't. I think that he's mad. I think he's disappointed. I think he's ashamed of me. Look what I just did. I'm sure he's not happy about that. If you're a parent, your child at one time or another has done something that you're not happy about, maybe even ashamed about, but you know what's never, ever questioned? The love you have for that child. Never, ever. That love doesn't go away. In time, it just gets bigger. But it doesn't mean that you like the behavior that they just did. And that's what parenting is, is to help channel that child in another way. But what you need to understand is 
the enemy wants to condemn you. And the Bible says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. The enemy wants to guilt you. The enemy wants to shame you. And God wants to exalt you, lift you up. So when thoughts come into your head, you must. Here's your spiritual weapon. It's the word of God. You've got to read the Bible. You need to be a Bible student. You need to be one that reads the Bible. We're in the process of reading the the New Testament right now. You can go on our website and connect and just start where where we're at. We're reading it four days a week, Monday through Thursday. It's all there for you. You can look at our website. You can go into our phone app. You can do the connection card. It's all everywhere we are electronically. You can find that link to tell you how. And you could just start there. But you need to read some systematic way of having the input of God's word inside you. You need to have some way that you are always hearing more of the word of God. You need to listen to solid preaching during the week, not just Sunday. You need to feed yourself. Why? Because one day you are going to face a snake in your room. And you need to be ready to pounce on it. You need to be ready to attack it. And when the thoughts come in, and you already know, and I'm thinking that I, I, I'm not worthy of God's love, I need to go to Scripture, and I need to say it again, and say it again, and say it again, and say it again, and repeat it, and read it, and confess it, and hold on to it, and make it part of me until I have chased that thought out. Because this is my AR-15. Amen. This is my weapon the spiritual weapon that God has for us. Casting down arguments and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, what I know about God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, verse six, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. This is simply telling us to destroy even the thoughts that seem innocent, even the little thoughts, even the the tiny ones, that aren't agreeing with the word of God. Jump back over to Romans 5, and we'll wrap up there. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, where we left off, here's what it says. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Why is it so important to understand Romans 5? Why is it important to understand justification, righteousness, reconciliation? All of it is trying to say from different viewpoints and different definitions and different ways that you are right with God. God is not ashamed of you. And if he's not ashamed of you, what will he do to help you wherever you're at in life today? He will do whatever it is that you believe for whatever it is you ask for, whatever it is that you extend your hand to and ask, God, I need your help. He's saying it again and again in Romans chapter five, trying to communicate. It's been taken care of. Your sin's been taken care of. Your wrongs have been taken care of. Your mistakes have been taken care of. Now God is trying to say, let's go live life together. Let's forget the past and let's go take on the future and let's get back what belongs to us. Let's get all the promises that God has declared in his scripture to be part of us. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The one man that made us all sinners is Adam. The one that made us righteous is Jesus. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But listen to this, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. The Greek word for abound means to increase considerably the extent of an activity or state with the implication of the result being an abundance. This is trying to communicate to us where the law came in, sin was now in abundance, but grace was in more abundance trying to tell you, yes, you may have made a mistake. Yes, you may have sinned. Don't come on. Let's, let's get real, right? Every one of you in this room, me included, even Mark. Can you believe it? Mark has sinned. We have sinned. 
even since we've been a believer. We have sinned, you could say accidentally, and sometimes flat out on purpose. Am I right? right? And this is trying to say, where sin abound, grace does much more abound. There is the grace of God to overpower that sin, to heal that sin, to get those who were hurt by the sin healed, to heal your own heart and to move forward. Where grace abounded, where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Look at verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, as sin had control over everybody and everybody died, even so grace, 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 grace might reign, might rule, might control through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ. The way you live in this life is the grace of God. When you are having a battle in your mind, when you're warring in the mind, when you're trying to cast down these these, uh, arguments and high things, you must know it is by grace that gives you the promise that gives you the ability to chase that thought out of your mind so that you can live outside that destructive thought. God wants you to know you are supposed to be in control of your mind, not just have it out there picking up anything that floats through the air. You are to think about who you are in Christ, what God has done for you, and how God is helping you. Amen? Amen? Hey, did you learn something today? Could we thank the Lord for the word? We don't like to end on a Sunday without you giving everyone an opportunity, whether in the house or online. I'd like to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, today's the day to do it. Ask yourself this honest question. If you died today, if something were to happen and your life was over, it ended, would you go to heaven? You say, I'm not sure. I don't know if I'd go to heaven. Well, you need to know. According to the Bible, hoping that you go to heaven doesn't make it. According to the Bible, wishing that you go to heaven doesn't make it. According to the Bible, desiring to go to heaven doesn't make it. According to the Bible, when you ask Jesus to be your Lord, you are guaranteed heaven. Not by your works, not by your means, but by his spirit and by his promise. God wants you in his family and the way you're gonna get into his family is for you to say yes to Jesus. So I'm asking you right here in the house, at home, would you bow your head, close your eyes? No one looking around. I wanna ask, you ask that question. If I died today, would I go to heaven? And if you're not sure, if you don't know, then right now is the time to say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, come into my heart. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you have that conversation with Jesus right now? Would you lift your head and open your eyes? If you said yes to Jesus, if you asked him into your life today, would you text the words new life to the phone number on the screen? If you'll text the words new life, we'll be able to send you a link with some information that's really important to help you on where you're at and what to do next and what's after that. It's important that we start correctly with Jesus. The enemy would love to come and take you away really fast and doubt even the act that you did today. Thoughts will come in and say, no, you're not saved. Look at you. Look how bad you are. You can't be a Christian. Look what you just did. It has nothing to do with it. What has to do with it is God said, I love you so much. If you call on the name of the Son, he will deliver you. He will save you. And so it's important that we just continue in that connection by getting into church, getting into the word of God, and moving forward. Amen.